Back in June 2024, I uninstalled Windows. I had been using Windows 11 and previously Windows 10. It had been a long haul, quite frankly, and I was getting very tired with the workflow of Windows. I was rather annoyed with the fact that they were focusing so heavily on Windows Copilot, and that was not something I really wanted to have on my computer in any capacity, or any computer for that matter. I was also, quite frankly, annoyed with the amount of RAM that it had started to use. My OS, while idling, was sitting at like 8 to 10 gigabytes at times, which just makes no logical sense. So instead, I installed Linux Mint. The reason I decided to settle on Mint, which I discuss in this video, was upon doing research, it seemed very straightforward. It seemed like one of the easier distros to get into. I needed a place to learn properly. I had messed around with Linux in the past, but that was mostly on Raspberry Pis. So while I wasn't totally inexperienced with Linux, I needed an easy on-ramp. Thus, the decision to go with Mint. But how has it been in the past three months? Well, I'll give you an idea. I actually purchased a laptop recently, and that laptop I am running also full-time Linux desktop. It's currently running a slightly more recent version of Linux Mint because I'm using it as my experimentation device. If I need to update something that I don't know how to do or want to mess around with a different distro, that's the tool that I will use because that laptop is pretty much empty. It's mostly just a word processor, which I use to write my blog, as well as a light editing device that I've used to edit shorts. Welcome to my desktop. The start menu feels more or less the same as Windows. Almost no learning curve there. In fact, if anything, I would say it feels better than modern Windows. It actually very much reminds me of using Windows 7, maybe earlier than that even. The learning curve was extremely smooth for me. Uh, most software can be installed through the software manager, which acts essentially like an app store. Although there is some oddities here, specifically with things like Discord, which make it a little bit suboptimal. OBS specifically was a harsh one. But as far as installing basic software like VLC, it's an absolute breeze and kind of just a joy to use. Simply click on it and then click install. Or you can go direct and everything just kind of runs well. The issues that I had with Discord can be described in a couple of sentences. This is the flat packed version, essentially meaning it installs it in a little bubble so that you can't mess with it and accidentally break it. Because Linux is an open system, you can go into the file structure of just about any piece of software and completely brick it if you decide to do that. And these flat pat flat blah, blah, blah. and these two flat pat and these two flat packed versions of Discord both have weird issues. I wasn't able to attach any files, and one of them, voice chatting, just didn't work at all. Thankfully, you can just install it through their website, and it runs natively on Ubuntu. And this version ran just fine, with absolutely no hiccups or issues. I'm able to run the normal Linux affair while using Discord, as you normally would, with literally zero problems. So let's talk a little bit more about software. Most of the software that I've been using for a very long time has been natively running on Linux anyway. VLC, Audacity, everything here has been working perfectly out of the box because they run natively. One of the things that kept me from moving to Linux initially was Adobe software. I'd been using Adobe Premiere Pro to edit my videos for a very long time, and that is one of the pieces of software that chronically is Windows locked. You cannot make Photoshop or Adobe Premiere Pro or After Effects for that matter, or anything from the editing suites work on Linux. There might be some crunkly workaround but frankly, I wasn't willing to jump through those hoops, which is what kept me on Windows probably for the last year. It also helps that the primary reason for this channel's existence is Dwarf Fortress content. And up until last year, Dwarf Fortress didn't run natively on Linux. So it was a little bit cagey to move over. But we'll talk about gaming a little bit later on in the video. The first thing I really want to talk about here is OBS, because this was one of the biggest issues I had early on while learning Linux. The initial process was actually easier than using Windows. I simply made a boot drive and installed the OS. It runs off of the boot drive, so you can actually mess around with it first and get a very good idea of what the workflow is like. I, I've now made it into here, so start Linux Mint. It's now installing. I had this monitor unplugged initially. It wants this monitor to be the default, and it has this monitor set like this, so... Gonna have to fix that, but we've done the install. But this is where I began to run into a few problems. Initially, I used the software manager to install OBS. And because I stream full time for a living, I have a very muddly OBS install, which includes a lot of different plugins. One of them gives me live captioning, one of them gave me uh, the ability to stream to multiple outputs, which then stopped working. No fault of my own, just the creator didn't update it as well as a few other programs that run under the hood. The flat-packed version 
isn't compatible with any of these plugins. And I had no idea of this. So initially, upon installing OBS, importing my profiles, I attempted to install plugins. This caused OBS to hard crash to desktop or launch with a lot of errors. While I could get it to launch in safe mode, I wasn't able to actually launch OBS. This led to me creating the Linux tech support channel on my Discord, which honestly has been extremely helpful. They suggested that I install OBS directly from the website instead of going through Flatpak. They suggested that I install OBS directly through their website, which I tried, and that led to the same problems. Constant crashing, issues with the plugins, and so forth. Eventually, it turned out that the solution was I had to install it using Terminal. Once I ran this command to install OBS Studio directly through Terminal as a possible workaround for the crashing issues and compatibility problems, I then learned that it's actually kind of difficult to uninstall stuff from Linux. So we had to go through some nuclear options here, which I won't like burden you with the entirety of, but I had to go through and completely nuke the directory for old OBS uh, running through Flatpak, as well as the direct installs to actually finally make OBS function properly. Once I did that, I was then able to properly install my plugins, finally. And then the next issue I was having shortly afterwards was Pipewire, because Pulse Audio is the audio driver that Linux Mint came prepackaged with in version 21, which in version 22, which I haven't updated to yet, this has actually been remedied because Pulse Audio is no longer the included driver, and now it's Pipewire. Fortunately, all that that required was a quick Linux Pipewire audio OBS plugin install, as easy as clicking and dragging this in here, allowed me to do all of my correct audio routing for OBS, which lets me play records on stream, as well as do all of the other weird audio bullshit that I do for streaming. Now, these are all kind of niche problems. I think your average user of OBS even would be totally fine with the flat packed version or just the direct install through the website. But at least for me, this was probably the harshest period of learning to use Linux. And this was in the first 72 hours. Thankfully, once all of that had been cleared, things got a lot smoother. Now I'm just gonna quickly talk about software that I also use on my daily basis, and this portion is gonna be a lot quicker because everything else runs natively. GIMP is the first piece of software that I use that runs natively because it's open source and it's ported to every single OS that I am aware of, including the PS3, for God's sake. My password manager is Bitwarden, which also runs natively on everything and has cross-platform support. So I have it on both my phone, the laptop, and the desktop. Bitwarden has been working flawlessly and the transition there was totally fine, no issues. Of course, Audacity runs just fine, no problems there. I never used Adobe Edition, so that was not a problem for me. I've been using Audacity as long as I can remember. VLC, of course, is an absolute godlike piece of software that is run by a bunch of French insane people who don't care about copyright protections, and frankly, I love them for that. For text editors and Office, I've been using LibreOffice, which comes pre-packed with Linux Mint. I've been using OpenOffice previously, and this is practically identical to that, so this has been a very easy learning curve there. But this was a big one. This is the video editing software I use. This is one of the more recent videos I uploaded. This is the video for Gortusk. This is Caden Live. Caden Live is a open source video editor, and it took me a couple of tries to find the right piece of software. The first video editing software I tried to use was Olive. Olive is a piece of software that I was slightly familiar with in the past, having messed around with it, and it aims to replicate, or aimed to replicate, the workflow of Adobe Premiere Pro. But it was too simplistic and hadn't been updated in a while, and quite frankly, wasn't particularly good. Very quickly, I realized I was going to need to find an alternative. So after a bit of research, I decided to go with Caden Live. The reason I decided to go with Caden Live is it very much felt good to use, moved quickly, even in large projects. There's very little lag between menus. In fact, I would say Caden Live feels better just as a second to second workflow editor than Adobe does on this computer, or at least did when I was using Windows. And the fact that I can push it practically to its limits with these hour long videos, I think is a testament to how well it runs. There is a little bit of lag when zooming in and zooming out and rendering could be a lot faster due to its lacking in support for modern rendering. That being said, I'll take some slow rendering for a workflow that I can easily and quickly learn. It has tools that I'm used to using now, and I've been quite pleased with the results. As far as updating software goes, all you really need to do is click on this little shield icon down here, and it'll give you a list of updates. If there are things you do not want to update, you can simply click on them and void them out, 
Alternatively, it's just a matter of clicking refresh occasionally or just restarting your computer. You get the package downloads and it'll check everything to see if it needs to be updated. It'll populate this list. Once the list is populated, you can see exactly what's coming in for each piece of software that needs to be updated. For web browsers, I've simply gone back to Firefox. I was using Brave for quite some time, and before that I was using Google Chrome. Yeah, I'm sad to admit, I, I was using Google Chrome for quite some time. While Brave was good, I actually quite liked its workflow just as a browser. Felt like Chrome, worked with all the Chrome plugins, worked with just about every website I needed it to work with, except for my online banking for some reason, which back in the Windows days I would just use Edge for that. <laughs> Brave had been dedicating a little bit too much to their AI assistant, Leo, so I decided to simply step away and just return to Firefox, which I'd used, again, about 10 years ago. The reason I had stopped using Firefox for so long is because Firefox had poor compatibility with a lot of plugins I use for Twitch. I don't see very well, and Twitch chat kind of can get hard to read at times, and I use a bunch of plugins for accessibility purposes. In the modern era, in the year 2024, all of those plugins are compatible with Firefox, so it's just kind of a non-issue. The last thing I want to kind of cover here is Terminal, so it can make you feel real cool, you know? You can update your system by doing this, assuming you can remember your password. It also gives you a list of things that can be upgraded, which makes it very easy to just simply type in sudo apt upgrade to update everything before it even pops up in the update manager. Because I was used to using Windows for so long, I was a little bit taken aback that there wasn't a task manager equivalent, at least not one that I could find. However, in terminal, the default is top, which I discovered almost immediately upon installing Linux. It's essentially task manager, but runs in terminal. I'm gonna open up another window of terminal here, and I'm gonna show you the one that I prefer. After messing around with several different variants, Ptop being probably the most recommended, I've settled on Glances, which looks like this. It's simply just a prettied up version of Top. I like it easier on the eyes, easier to read, a lot clearer. I understand the fears that a lot of people have of moving to Linux. People are very protective of their OS. People are very protective of the things they know and they don't want their day to day to be flipped. But honestly, for me, using Linux so far has just felt like using old Windows. And that's honestly a good thing. It's taken me back to an era of computing that felt exciting and new. It also makes me feel way cooler than I actually am. Because I can do that. Now I mentioned at one point earlier in the video that we are going to talk a little bit about games. So let's talk about games. Steam was easy enough to install directly through their website. And everything that doesn't run natively uh, through Linux runs surprisingly well through compatibility mode. When you run through the initial install of the OS, it asks you to install drivers. I'm using the native NVIDIA drivers because, frankly, I don't care. <laughs> and I'd rather have stuff updated as soon as they're available rather than having to wait for the open source alternatives. Of course, if you're using an AMD graphics card, you'll probably be in a more consistently updated state, but I was willing to make the sacrifice. I don't play a lot of very graphically intensive games, and I also don't play any multiplayer games. If you're playing things like Valorant, Linux might be a little problematic for you, because the anti-cheat will not run on Linux. While you can force it to run through various means, you'll probably end up getting your account terminated before long. As an example, games such as Manor Lords, which doesn't even run natively on Linux, if you go into Properties, Compatibility, and Force Compatibility Options, the game runs flawlessly without issues. While I don't play a lot of graphically intense games or things with ray tracing, I do have to say that everything I have tested that is more in the graphically demanding level has been perfectly fine. So for me, if you're interested in gaming on Linux, all you need to do is just look and see if it's compatible with the Steam Deck. If it's compatible with the Steam Deck, you'll have absolutely zero issue. If it says it's functional on the Steam Deck, then you'll probably also have no issue. And if it says it's not compatible with the Steam Deck, if that happens to be your favorite game, you might want to think twice about running desktop full time. But if you're like me, and you primarily play single player stuff that isn't that graphically intensive, you're not going to have any problems. All of the software, more or less, with the exception of Adobe, ran natively on Linux, and that just took a little bit of experimentation to find a version that works. The process of learning the OS felt like learning an older version of Windows again, and that was fun. Actually, kind of exciting. It's nice to change your workflow every now and again and experience a different portion of computing. 
It's also nice to be able to have an OS that uses a fraction of the... It's also nice to have an OS that uses a fraction of the resources that Windows does. And the only reason it's so high right now is because OBS is running. Yes, I did have some problems installing OBS, but Pipewire is now the only driver that is used if you install a recent install of Linux Mint. Linux Mint 22 comes with it pre-packed, which is what's installed on the laptop. If you're even remotely tech savvy and capable of creating a boot drive, I recommend giving it a shot, especially if you have an extra computer. To give you an idea on how easy this has been, I've actually converted my parents over to it too as well, since installing myself. I made my dad a boot drive, and he's installed it on one of his desktops, because my parents basically use their computer for word processing, email, and basic Google search. And my dad was already using OpenOffice already, so just like me, it was a very easy transition for them. I think that if you use your computer for basic tasks, or if you only play single player games. Personally, I genuinely feel that we are in the age of the Linux desktop. There will always be a little bit of tinkering. If you use a prepackaged disco, blah, 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 blah. if you use a prepackaged di distro, such as Mint or Pop OS, you'll probably have a very easy time of it, presuming you know how to computer a little bit. Thank you very much for watching this video, and also thanks for the attention I got on the first video. Do you use Linux? What distro do you use? Do you use Arch, by the way? Or are you like me and using something a little bit simpler? I've been very happy with this experience. I'm glad that I did it, and I'm looking forward to maybe messing around with another distro on the laptop. If there's one you think I would like, or one you think I should mess with, let me know down in the comments section. I'm not guaranteed to swap over or anything, but I might give it an install on the laptop. Thank you very much for watching this video. Take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you in the next one. One final thing before I go. This weekend, I'm going to be spending most of my time after I upload this video editing the next big project, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Thanks for watching.